You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Corbett Report podcast. I'm your host, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you from the sunny climes of Western Japan here in March of 2020 with episode 373 of the Corbett Report podcast, Medical Martial Law 2020. Now, if you follow the feeds at CorbettReport.com, you will know that last week I re-released a section of an old podcast, specifically episode 86 of the Corbett Report podcast on medical martial law, which was released in 2009 in the height of the swine flu pandemic pandemonium that was sweeping the globe at that time. And just last week, Corporate Report video editor Brock West revivified a section of that podcast in video format for release as a video to bring people up to speed on what I was talking about 11 years ago in regards to the the laying of the infrastructure and legislative framework for the implementation of medical martial law in any declared public health emergency. And there are many different pieces, different cookie crumbs along that trail leading towards that medical martial law conclusion. Uh, and so I will exhort you, if you've not yet done so, to go back and not just re-watch that video section of the podcast, but listen to the entire podcast, which lays it out in a great degree of detail. And I will be taking that information for granted, that you are uh, familiar with the steps that have already been put in place that I was outlining in episode 86. For example, the Model State Emergency Health Powers Act, which was drafted in the wake of the 2001 anthrax bioterror false flag event, which was subsequently adopted by over 40 states and allows for quarantines and mandated vaccinations in the event of any declared public health emergency. And it is that Model State Emergency Health Powers Act, which gave rise to legislation in numerous different state legislatures that are now being implemented as I speak in various states declaring public health emergencies. So it is important to have that uh, that background and that, uh, uh, that legislative framework in place in your mind. So uh, once again, I will exhort you to go back and re-familiarize yourself with the material in that previous podcast. But as you might guess from the title of today's podcast, I'm going to be updating uh, the 11 years of information that has taken place between then and now to move us a little further along that road towards what we are seeing right now, which is the flicking of the switch and the turning on of the apparatus for medical martial law. It is happening, and it is important to understand how we got to where we are today in order to better understand what is likely to happen in the near future and what we can actually do about this. So roll up your sleeves, get a pen and paper. There's going to be a data dump of information today, but don't worry, as always, all of the links to all of the documents and videos and everything that we go through today will be in the show notes for today's episode at CorbettReport.com. If you are watching this on some variant of social media, the link to the show notes will be in the description for this video. So that being said, let's get straight into it. And actually, we're going to start with a document that was originally drafted and put on the books in 2007, but actually was not released to the public at that time. We're just finding out about it now in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic freakout. So we're getting this information from The Nation, uh, which on March 12th, 2020, reported on an internal pandemic document which shows the coronavirus gives Trump extraordinary powers. Specifically, uh, they are talking about a document called the Operations Plan for Pandemic Response, which uh, was drafted for the uh, CBP, the Customs and Border Protection Agency. And that document is in this article, the complete document, so you can go and read through it. Uh, full confession, I haven't had time to read through the entire document yet, but I have skimmed through uh, important passages of it. And the nation frames this story this way. They say on Wednesday, that was previous Wednesday now, the World Health Organization designated the coronavirus a pandemic, meaning that the disease is now considered to have spread worldwide. But pandemics also confer extraordinary privileges on U.S. authorities. Last night, Trump announced a ban 
for the next 30 days on travelers flying from Europe to the United States. Well, already things have progressed much further than that, as you know, but this was the information at the time this article was drafted. And an internal CBP uh, pandemic response plan obtained by the nation outlines the Immigration and Border Agency's ability to actively surveil and detain individuals suspected of carrying the illness. Titled Operations Plan for Pandemic Response and marked for official use only, the document was drafted during the avian flu pandemic of 2007. It's a blunt statement of authority describing Customs and Border Patrol overseeing potential tent cities of quarantined detainees at the border and coordinating with unspecified intelligence agencies, both foreign and domestic as well as the Pentagon. Now, as I say, I will invite you to go and read the document for yourself and read the article uh, from the nation that frames that document, but it does frame it in a highly partisan way, talking about the evil Trump administration and their war on immigrants as if this pandemic response plan uh, that is in place, and as they state in this article, is the on the current on-the-record CBP pandemic response plan that is being used as the guidebook for what is happening right now, as if all of this only applies to immigrants or or people from the third world or something, this applies to everyone, including, of course, even American citizens attempting to return to the United States and does make them subject to the whims of CBP officials uh, such that uh, it, coming into contact or exposure with this virus or e- exhibiting any symptoms of what could be COVID-19 is enough for the CBP to flex its muscle and authority granted through this document to put people in quarantine in tent cities. And if there actually is, or in any future case was, some sort of actually infectious bioweapon or whatever that's spreading through the population, a great way to make sure someone catches it is to lock them in a tent city with a lot of other people who presumably do have it. But that being said, uh, the document is uh, just another glimpse into the types of powers that are on the books and have been laid out for years in the event of what we're seeing today. And it is important to keep this in mind. Again, this uh, we're, we're looking at a lot of documents from the United States context today, but this applies to countries all around the world. And I know my home and native land of Canada is even at the current moment refusing entry even to Canadian citizens who are exhibiting any signs or symptoms of COVID-19. They will not even be allowed to board a plane to come to Canada at this current time. Even Canadian citizens, there are people out, uh, living abroad with permanent residencies or, or visas that are about to expire that are going to come home to Canada or were going to come home to Canada. They cannot do so because they are not allowed to and are in a legal limbo now. Um, th- this sort of thing is exactly what was planned out in these pandemic response plans, including this particular document from the CBP. So uh, take a look at that. Uh, But let's move ahead in the timeline from 2007 to 2010, where we encounter lockstep. And lockstep comes from a series of scenarios uh, that were laid out by the Rockefeller Foundation in conjunction with the Global Business Network and that were described in a document called Scenarios for the Future of Technology and international development. And this document starts by noting that the Rockefeller Foundation believes that in order to understand the many ways in which technology will impact international development in the future, we must first broaden and deepen our individual and collective understanding of the range of possibilities. This report and the project upon which it is based is one attempt to do that. In it, we share the outputs and insights from a year-long project undertaken by the Rockefeller Foundation and Global Business Network designed to explore the role of technology in international development through scenario planning, a methodology in which GBN is a longtime leader. It goes on to describe more about why it's choosing these various scenarios and why it's focusing on technology. But long story short, there are a number of different scenarios that they envision of what could happen in a more technologically dependent world in the future and what must happen as a result of that. And one of these scenarios that they were planning, again, on the records in 2010, was called Lockstep. And let me know if this sounds familiar to you. The document starts by noting that Lockstep is uh, a scenario which involves a world of tighter top-down government control and more authoritarian leadership, 
with limited innovation and growing citizen pushback. And it starts by the scenario by noting, In 2012, the pandemic that the world had been anticipating for years finally hit. Unlike 2009's H1N1, swine flu, this new influenza strain, originating from wild geese, was extremely virulent and deadly. Even the most pandemic-prepared nations were quickly overwhelmed when the virus streaked around the world, infecting nearly 20% of the global population and killing 8 million in just 7 months, the majority of them healthy young adults. The pandemic also had a deadly effect on economies. International mobility of both people and goods screeched to a halt, debilitating industries like tourism and breaking global supply chains. Hmm, sounds familiar. Even locally, normally bustling shops and office buildings sat empty for months, devoid of both employees and customers. The pandemic blanketed the planet, though disproportionate numbers died in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central America, where the virus spread like wildfire in the absence of official containment protocols. But even in developed countries, containment was a challenge. The United States' initial policy of strongly discouraging citizens from flying proved deadly in its leniency, accelerating the spread of the virus not just within the U.S., but across borders. However, a few countries did fare better, China in particular. The Chinese government's quick imposition and enforcement of mandatory quarantine for all citizens, as well as its instant and near-hermetic sealing off of all borders, saved millions of lives, stopping the spread of the virus far earlier than in other countries, and enabling a swift post-pandemic recovery. China's government was not the only one that took extreme measures to protect its citizens from risk and exposure. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions, from the mandatory wearing of face masks to body temperature checks at the entries to communal spaces like train stations and supermarkets. Even after the pandemic faded, the more this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and the, their activities stuck and even intensified. In order to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly global problems, from pandemics and transnational terrorism to environmental crises and rising poverty, leaders around the world took a firmer grip on power. You can continue reading through this scenario and the way it played out in the uh, scenario planner's fevered imagination, Um, but Later on, it notes in a sidebar, for example, the role of philanthropy in lockstep, talking about those wonderful philanthropic organizations, like one would presume the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, which I'm not sure was in operation in 2010. At any rate, probably wasn't as big uh, as as big an influence in pandemic response back in 2010. But anyway, that type of organization, which, as you know from previous Corbett Report episodes, is always just a virtuous uh a bounty of plenty descended from the heavens by these virtuous philanthropists out of complete lack of self-interest, right? No, of course not. But it does go on to talk about how philanthropic organizations will face hard choices in the world of lockstep, and given the strong role of governments, they will have to require they will require heightened diplomacy skills, and they'll basically have to uh, more closely work with national official development assistance strategies to meet government objectives. Um, but in the, specifically in the part where they talk about technology in lockstep, they talk about some of the things that were implemented in this scenario in order to uh, crack down on the pandemic, including scanners using advanced functional magnetic resonance imaging technology becoming the norm at airports and other public areas to detect abnormal behavior that may indicate antisocial intent, i.e., brain reading, scanning cameras and and other technologies to basically read your mind and see if you're a secret terrorist. In the aftermath of pandemic scares, smarter packaging for food and beverages is applied to by big companies and producers in business-to-business environment. Oh, yay. New diagnostics are developed to detect communicable diseases. Telepresence technologies respond to the demand for less expensive, lower-bandwidth, sophisticated communication systems for populations whose travel is restricted. And driven by protectionism and national security concerns, nations create their own independent, regionally defined IT networks, mimicking China's firewalls. So they crack down on the internet. And then it goes into an example of a personal story from this life in lockstep, Manisha, 
uh, living in the on the banks of the Ganges River. And it goes through her experience, and it's worth reading. There are some interesting insights in there, including how the uh, the national government of India saved the the population during the quarantine period. Uh, during the pandemic. And that experience, thought Manisha, had given the government the confidence to be strict about river usage now, several years after the pandemic. How else could they get millions of Indian citizens to completely shift their cultural practices in relationship to a holy site? Well, good question. How else would you do that other than a very traumatic situation as envisioned by the Rockefeller Foundation and Global Business Network in 2010? The lockstep document, an important piece of this puzzle. I will put, of course, the link in the show notes. So please go and read through that for yourself. Let's move ahead in the timeline to 2013. Uh, This being pointed out recently by Dr. Rudolf Hansel in an article titled The Coronavirus and the New World Order, War is in the Air, in which Dr. Hansel writes, On the 11th of March 2020, the New Rheinische Zeitung drew attention in the article Two Corona Mosaic Stones to a publication by the German government in January 2013, the Information from the German Government Report on Risk Analysis in Civil Protection 2012 that was released on the 3rd of January 2013. In it, frightening similarities with what is currently happening can be seen, in particular by explicitly mentioning the SARS coronavirus, COV. The scenario presented, in which the spread, course, duration, mortality, etc. are described, goes as far as to make a drastic restriction of fundamental rights necessary. The scenario states, in this respect, the competent authorities first of all, the public health authorities and primarily the public health officers, must take measures to prevent communicable diseases. The IFSG, the relevant legislation, allows, among other things, restrictions of basic rights, such as the right to the inviolability of the home. Within the framework of necessary protective measures, the fundamental right of personal freedom and the freedom of assembly can also be restricted. In addition to these measures, to be ordered directly by the public health officer, the Federal Ministry of Health can order by statutory order that threatened sections of the population have to take part in protective vaccinations or other measures of specific prophylaxis, whereby the right to physical integrity can be restricted. I would suggest to go back and read and reread that passage several times until it sinks in. But yes, in 2013, the German government was already drafting scenarios that envisioned mandatory vaccinations or specific prophylaxis in the event of a spreading communicable disease. And oh yeah, restrictions on the right of uh, uh, personal freedom and freedom of assembly, which is particularly convenient in a period where, as I've had cause to note in recent times, this is a period in which a lot of protest is happening all around the globe, all at the same time, and the globalists are on the run, right? What could they possibly do to avoid the big people's uprising that's coming? Oh, that's right, a nationally, globally declared public health emergency that will restrict freedom of assembly and freedom of travel, freedom to gather in groups of more than 10 people in country after country. Bye-bye, yellow vests. I guess it was it was fun while it lasted, huh? Uh, bye-bye, Hong Kong and everywhere else. I mean, everywhere else that has any sort of protest movement. Well, not anymore. No one is going to be out assembling in protest of this. And if they do, well, medical martial law is already in place. That was laid out in a document in 2013 by the German government. Fast forward in the timeline to 2015, that is when the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation enters the picture in a big way, because that is specifically when Bill Gates set his sights on the pandemic panic. And we get this from a basically a public relations campaign that he started engaging in 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 that time frame, including a Vox.com video where Ezra Klein interviews Bill Gates about what he is most afraid of, and spoiler alert, he's most afraid of a globally spreading pandemic like the 1918 Spanish flu. And at the time, he was also writing an op-ed in the New England Journal of Medicine about the Ebola scare of 2014. Remember that? The big Ebola scare? You're gonna die of Ebola? Um... 
newsflash, I don't think I don't think many Americans did die of Ebola, but it was the big pandemic scare of 2014, which I covered extensively at the time. I'll put links back to my work on that topic uh, at the time. Uh, but at, uh, in the wake of that, in April of 2015. Uh, Bill Gates wrote uh, an op-ed, essentially, in the New England Journal of Medicine called The Next Epidemic, Lessons from Ebola, which was part of this pandemic, panic, freakout, public relations campaign that he was on at the time. And that article includes a very telling paragraph. It's instructive to compare our preparations for epidemics with our preparations for another sort of global threat, war. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, has a mobile unit that it is, it is ready to deploy quickly. Although the system is not perfect, NATO countries participate in joint exercises in which they work out logistics such as how fuel and food will be provided, what language they will speak, and what radio frequencies will be used. Few, if any, such measures are in place for response to an epidemic. The world does not fund any organization to manage the broad set of coordinated activities required in an ep epidemic. The last serious simulation of an epidemic in the United States, the Dark Winter Exercise, took place in 2001, and few countries have met their commitments under the international health regulations which were adopted by the United Nations after the 2002-2003 outbreak of the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, SARS, and were intended to improve the world's ability to prevent and contain outbreaks. So many important nuggets just in that paragraph alone, one of which is the Dark Winter Exercise, which, as Bill Gates notes, took place in 2001. And if you are unfamiliar with the Dark Winter Exercise, boy, it is time to get up to speed on that. I have talked about it in the past, but like a lot of this work, many, many years in the past, so you may not have seen it. But that was a simulation of an anthrax bioterror scare in the United States shortly before 9-11 and the anthrax attacks of October 2001, almost as if they were live simulating something that they were about to do. Almost. Uh, what an amazing coincidence. Uh, extremely interesting, and you should take a look at that exercise and the fact that it contained faux news reports that were dressed up to look like real news reports about how the anthrax was spreading and how it was affecting different populations. Again, some of the very people responding to the October 2001 anthrax crisis sitting there at the tabletop exercise in 2001. Um, also, of course, war wartime footing. We need a wartime footing for pandemic response and that is uh, something that's popping up in the news as I speak. Emergency war powers that have not been invoked since the Korean War, for example, in the case of the United States, are being invoked right now because we are at war once again, this time with a hidden enemy. Where have we heard that type of rhetoric before? And uh, the, again, invoking the specter of SARS, the coronavirus, of course, now we're de dealing with SARS-CoV-2, the electric boogaloo. So a lot of things go back to this. Uh, it's an important article for people to uh, to read through to understand the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and their angle on this, the philanthropic organizations who are going to help to coordinate the international global response that will be necessary. This is, of course, what it always comes back to because some people are saying this is the end of globalization as we've known it. This is going to upend everything. On the contrary, this is a fail-forward event in which the very globalist uh, purveyors of the globalist ideology are going to push even further and even harder. We're going to need a global pandemic response agency that's going to be funded by all countries and is going to be able to subsume the national sovereignty of any given country as a result of what's happening right now. And that was, again, laid out by Bill Gates five years ago. Let's move forward to 2017, where the very parting shots of the Obama administration were, were an interesting piece of legislation that, again, seems highly relevant to what's taking place today. We'll get this from NPR, National Petroleum Radio, as James Evan Pilato likes to call it, which uh, had an article in February 2017. CDC seeks controversial new quarantine powers to stop outbreaks. Federal health officials may be about to get greatly enhanced powers to quarantine people as part of an ongoing effort to stop outbreaks of dangerous, contagious diseases. The new powers are outlined in a set of regulations the Center of Disease Control and Prevention uh, published last, late last month to update the agency's quarantine authority for the first time since the 1940s. The outline changes are being welcomed by many health lawyers, bioethicists, and public health specialists as providing important tools for protecting the public. But the CDC's increased authority is also raising fears that the rules could be misused 
in ways that violate civil liberties. The update was finalized at the end of the Obama administration and was scheduled to go into effect February 21st, but the Trump administration is reviewing the changes as part of its review of new regulations, so the soonest the changes could go into effect has been pushed to the end of March. Spoiler alert, yes, the changes went into effect. And there's obviously more ongoing right now with regards to the rules that are being written on the fly for a pandemic response to the latest coronavirus freakout. But uh, this was the what was said into this uh, books in 2017. Again, please go to the article to read more about the potential for violations of civil liberties. Oh, you don't say. Well, you do say. But of course, all of that is just preparatory because all of that took place in the previous paradigm. Since 9-11, we've been living under the War of Terror paradigm, which has defined the economic, geopolitical, and domestic political uh, reality that we have been living in one way or another. And that was palpable, absolutely inescapable for the first decade after 9-11, where, as was famously parodied in a number of places, Family Guy and elsewhere, simply saying 9-11 in a political speech was enough to get a round of applause. Terrorist, terrorist, 9-11, terrorist. That was the paradigm we were living under. Obviously, that has frayed in recent years. It doesn't quite have the same magical power to spellbind the public as it did just a few years ago. And that paradigm is now being put, replaced. We are now in a new paradigm. And that paradigm did not start in March of 2020 with this current implementation of the coronavirus freakout. No, it started before the coronavirus itself started transmitting amongst the human population, at least officially to the extent that we actually know anything about the real origins of what's happening right now. No, 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 no. This started back in October of 2019, specifically October 18th, 2019. And that new paradigm was announced in New York City by the Center for Health Security in Event 201. It began in healthy-looking pigs months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care. Many died. The mission of the Pandemic Emergency Board is to provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. The board is comprised of highly experienced leaders from business, public health, and civil society. We're at the start of what's looking like it will be a severe pandemic. And there are problems emerging that can only be solved by global business and governments working together. Public health agencies have issued travel advisories, while some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. As a result, the travel sector is taking a huge hit. Travel bookings are down 45% and many flights have been canceled. Governments need to be willing to do things that are out of their historical perspective. Or, for the most part, it's, it's really a, a war footing that we need to be on. We shouldn't underestimate the uh, power of entrepreneurship. We need to escalate that, whether it's through you know, the governments um, helping with tax breaks or you know, subsidies of that nature to, to, to increase manufacturing of those types of products. It can happen quickly. A Marshall-type plan, uh, you know, I don't mean to say that exactly, but a Marshall plan that can go into effect uh, can stimulate uh, change very quickly. Now, as I'm sure you know, if you do follow alternative media, much has been said already about Event 201 and what was taking place there. If you're completely new to it all, I will put links into the video and to the website and to the press release and other materials that will give you a better sense of what Event 201 was and what it was attempting to do, at least officially speaking. And I will also provide links to uh, the Propaganda Report, the propreport.com, which has done a special report about the Event 201 agenda, highlighting the recommendations, the call to action that was issued as a result of this tabletop exercise that was held in New York in October of 2019, involving some of the very players who are now 
uh, in the front lines of this fight against the coronavirus pandemic that they themselves were simulating, exactly like Dark Winter. And that includes the heads of the U.S. CDC and the Chinese CDC and others. The full list of participants will be linked in the show notes. But uh, specifically in this call to action, they talk about the various things that the World Economic Forum, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation jointly propose as a result of their findings playing out this coronavirus pandemic scenario in October. Uh, Number one, governments, international organizations, and businesses should plan now for how essential corporate capabilities will be utilized during a large-scale pandemic. Two, industry, national governments, and international organizations should work together to enhance internationally held stockpiles of medical countermeasures to enable rapid and equitable distribution during a severe pandemic. Three, countries, international organizations, and global transportation companies should work together to maintain travel and trade during severe pandemics. Travel and trade are essential to the global economy as well as to national and even local economies, and they should be maintained even in the face of a pandemic. Four, government should provide more resources and support for the development and surge manufacturing of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics that will be needed during a severe pandemic. Five, global business should recognize the economic burden of pandemics and fight for stronger preparedness. Six, international organizations should prioritize reducing economic impacts of epidemics and pandemics. And seven, Governments in the private sector should assign a greater priority to developing methods to combat mis- and disinformation prior to the next pandemic response. Please do go read through that full list. It's such reasonable things that in light of what has happened since October 2019, it's absolutely amazing that they were able to foresee what was coming. And look, they had this perfectly amazing list of responses already waiting for something like this to come along so that they could shake their their paper in the face of these world leaders and say, look, we told you so. Now we have the plan for exactly what you should do about this, including as point number seven in that uh, call to action makes very explicit the crackdown on what is deemed to be mis- and disinformation by the authoritative sources in the fact-checking world, no doubt, about the pandemic outbreak. And what are we seeing right now? As I just went over with James Evan Pilato in New World next week, all of the big tech companies are now actively coordinating and collaborating with the U.S. government in order to crack down on coronavirus misinformation, which... Oh, by the way, as a bug, Facebook just accidentally basically censored and blocked and removed every single article and post on coronavirus recently. But that was just a bug, folks. Don't worry. They're they're ironing out the wrinkles in that system, and it will all be better soon once they have the right censorship uh, things dialed in properly. And of course, the WHO director did come out and say that what we're dealing with is not just a pandemic. It's an infodemic. So... This has already been seeded into the popular imagination, and uh, it was already sitting there waiting to be enacted by the Event 201 crew, who are the very ones coordinating the response to the real-life version of what they simulated. And just as a, a little extra nugget, because you cannot make this stuff up, one of the toys that they gave away at Event 201 to the people attending that event were plushies, coronavirus microbe plushies that were given away to all of the participants. Oh, isn't that so cute? They had little coronavirus plushies that they got to take home with them as a little souvenir, a little memento of the dawning of the new age of coronavirus-led microbial terror. But don't worry, the good folks at PolitiFact have come along and deemed it mostly false that Event 201 gave out stuffed souvenir coronavirus toys, because as they go on to note, well, yes, They did actually give out stuffed toys that really are meant to be coronavirus microbes, but uh, context is everything, and they weren't actually predicting the novel coronavirus that they were talking about simulating in that simulation. (laughs) Again, all of these fact-checkers are parodies of themselves, but this is the framework that has been decided upon for censoring information on the internet from here on forward. So if you're hearing my voice... Consider yourself lucky that you have found it at uh, at all, and uh, 
who knows how long this type of message will be allowed to be spread on the internet via any sort of major uh, platform. Um, but as I say, Event 201, October 2018, uh, 2019, really was the marking of the new era that we have stumbled into one way or another. And that era is now coming to fruition. And there are many different aspects of what's going on right now and the very many different power grabs that are being taken by authoritarian structures all around the world. Just as after 9-11, every authoritarian in the world was happy to see that event occur in the sense that it gave them carte blanche to call all of their enemies terrorists and launch a war upon them. Well, now... The, uh, authoritarian structures around the world are benefiting from the massive power grab that is taking place right under our nose. And there are many different aspects to this, including the incredible steps that have just taken place just in the past few hours. Uh, as I'm recording this podcast, Trump taps emergency powers as virus relief plan proceeds, in which we are learning that a 70-year-old wartime uh, piece of legislation known as the Defense Production Act is being uh, put into place to essentially nationalize certain uh, industries and services at the behest of the government to uh, create medical relief supplies. Well, isn't this great? We can nationalize industry and make sure that it all works and functions in the way that we need in order to save lives, of course. That's what it's always about. Well, we will get more into the economic and other aspects of what's going on in future editions of this podcast, but today we're focusing specifically on the invocation of martial law and martial law type powers on the back of what is happening right now. And you don't have to go very far to see that that is exactly what is happening even as I speak. Now, the epicenter of this outbreak, the city of Wuhan, has just handed over the first of two temporary hospitals to the Chinese military medical teams. In response to the worsening situation and ahead of an anticipated nationwide curfew, the IDF entered its highest state of alert, which practically means the Israeli military's emergency preparedness for war. Uh, the president of the region of Lombardy has said that he wants uh, the military to be called in to enforce the lockdown, calling on people to stay at home. This is really the mantra that they're sh leading out to the public at large. This morning, emergency measures in New York. The state's governor deploying the National Guard to New Rochelle, a suburb of New York City, in an effort to contain a coronavirus outbreak there. Residents within a one-mile radius required to stay within the area for a two-week period. It is a dramatic action, but it is the largest cluster in the country. And this is literally a matter of uh, life and death. Anybody can look at a map, and basically New Rochelle is a point where if you have the military, you can deploy them within 15 miles of each choke point. And then the city and Long Island are both landlocked. I am faced with the podcaster's dilemma of sitting here in March 2020 in the midst of an ongoing and unfolding story, the end of which... I obviously do not know and cannot present to you. I can only present to you the slices of information that I have at my disposal as I'm recording this, which will undoubtedly already be out of date by the time you're listening to this, even if you listen to it as soon as I release it, let alone days, weeks, months, or years after the fact. So I can only give you a slice of the information that is at hand right now, but I can tell you that martial law and the specter of martial law is very much in the air in the United States and elsewhere, reflected in any number of stories that are trending on the news pages right now, the mainstream news pages, about what is martial law and is martial law coming to America. For example, we can get this from Fox Business. What is martial law? Increase in COVID-19 related rules, curfews has led to circulation of rumors surrounding martial law. And it helpfully defines martial law as a term that describes the government order of replacing civil rule with the military in a time of war or emergency. And in the U.S., it notes the president must order for the establishment of martial law, which would in turn transfer power into the hands of the army. But the char change in power must only last through the duration of the emergency, according to Cornell Law School's Legal Information Institute. Well, actually, for people who have been paying attention over the past 
18 years, the national emergency that was declared on 9-11 has been renewed every single year by every single president since then. Uh, so there is a state of emergency, which some researchers, like Peter Dale Scott, who knows what he's talking about, has said, uh, essentially, the Constitution has been null and void since that point. There, there has been a martial law scenario in place in the United States uh, that has been operating. But that sounds like conspiracy theory. If that was the case... Surely we would know about it, wouldn't we? Oh, would we? So exactly what has and has not the president declared? What exactly is his authority in a situation of emergency anyway? Uh, actually, that's classified. And don't look to conspiracy theorist James Corbett for that take. Look to CNN, where Zachary Wolf just reported in the last 24 hours, what's the full extent of Trump's disaster authority? That's classified security expert says. And this uh, article cites Elizabeth Goyton, the co-director of the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University, who notes that there is no single law giving the federal government authority to lock down the entire country, but there are secret documents that have never been publicly released giving the president emergency powers. So, the, uh, the, the emergence into the public consciousness of the fact that there are secret orders that Americans are going to be subject to, and presumably already are, although we don't really know, because again, you're not allowed to know even what powers exist, let alone whether or not they've been enacted. Um, so take the public declaration of this is martial law for what it's worth, which is not very much, because there does not need to be such a public declaration when all of these uh, uh, secret classified uh, powers are already at work behind the scenes. Uh, here's something that we can see on the surface is, uh, for example, militarytimes.com reporting on here's the latest National Guard mobilizations by state, talking about how governments across 23 states have mobilized components of the Army and Air National Guard to assist in their state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, including drawing up over 2,000 guardsmen to active duty status. Um, but it, for a more in-depth look at what is Coming, we can look to articles like this one, Coronavirus versus Constitution, What Can Government Stop You From Doing in a Pandemic? And although this is obviously uh, from the Sacramento Bee, it is not a thoroughgoing exploration of the years of uh, considered legislative framework and, and pandemic response plans and drills and secret documents that we've been going through uh, today, let alone in episode 86 of this podcast, but it does give you some sense of what's going on right now. It says public closures, a ban on gatherings, quarantine notices, and orders for isolation have become increasingly common as the coronavirus continues to spread across the United States. Officials in Washington State and San Francisco are limiting the number of people allowed to attend public gatherings. Again, this is already outdated information. The governor of California joined them on Thursday, urging the cancellation of all events with more than 250 people in attendance. Oh, what a difference a week makes. But if it seems these actions are infringing on individual freedoms guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution, think again. And it says, you don't have a right to assemble against the backdrop of known public health risk, James G. Hodge told McClatchy News. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Oh, there's a, there's a public health risk that's been declared by authorities? All right. All that's off the table. Everything scrapped. That's what the... That's what this country was founded on. That's what we fought and died for was... Uh, some president come along and declare an emergency and everything is off the table. And please note that whatever takes place in the coming weeks, this is the precedent that will be used in the future. And even if you agree 100% with what is happening right now, that there is a real known public health risk that is threatening people and threatening lives, so it is absolutely necessary for the government to invoke these powers and take all your privileges and rights away, well, that will happen again and again and again. And imagine, just imagine if some duplicitous leader somehow or other got in some position of authority and used this pandemic panic button or any other button in the emergency button room to invoke these powers uh, for their own political gain or purposes. 
Could that ever happen? Oh, not in the United States. Um, more pieces on this of this puzzle that we can put together at this point. Um, for example, Politico last week reporting on how America's national security machine stares down a viral threat, noting how the National Security Council is coordinating the White House's response to this pandemic, has been in charge of it since mid-January. They are coordinating with the intelligence agencies and presumably with the military as well on uh, emergency plans for what is coming. And we also get this glimpse uh, just in the last couple of days from seattletimes.com in an article that was, again, immediately scrubbed by Facebook as part of their bug, which is having a little problem censoring the right misinformation in this coronavirus infodemic. Uh, but this article, U.S. government tech industry discussing ways to harness location data to combat coronavirus. The U.S. government is in active talks with Facebook, Google, and a wide array of tech companies and health experts about how they can use location data gleaned from Americans' phones to combat the novel coronavirus, including tracking whether people are keeping one another at safe distances to stem the outbreak. That's right, the little slave device you were carrying around in your pocket is giving your location data at all times to the big tech companies that we know on the record are collaborating and coordinating with the US government in all sorts of programs above board and under, uh, under the table, like the PRISM program, to give that data to the government so it can track your movements only for the sake of public health, of course, only because there's a pandemic spreading. So we need to know exactly where you've been, who you're talking to, how far apart you are keeping from those people, whether you're complying with isolation orders and all of that can be done electronically, technologically by the thing that you yourself are carrying around with you at all times of your own free will. You're doing this of your own free will. There's no government authority being imposed upon you, right, citizen? This isn't martial law. And of course, again, this is not just the United States. It is happening this way all throughout the world. Israel joins totalitarian states using coronavirus to spy on citizens, reports the American Conservative, which has an interesting take on this, uh, noting that Israel's internal security service, the Shin Bet, will be allowed to use personal cell phone data and information, such as which cell tower a device pings to, to retroactively track the movements of carriers of the coronavirus in order to see with whom they interacted in the days and weeks before they were tested, in order to place those people in quarantine. So, again, look at the power that is now being taken completely for granted. Simply having been in the vicinity, or having one of your devices been in the vicinity of a device of someone who has then been declared uh, by a faulty test that we know is not worth the paper that it's written on, to have been a carrier of this virus, you can then be quarantined. And you cannot assemble in, in groups of more than 10 people, and you cannot... All of these things that would be necessary for any type of resistance to any sort of governmental measure are now systematically being scrapped and stripped from the public, not to widespread approbation, but to cheers from the public. Yay! Let's get those damn quarantine evaders. Uh, he was called a terrorist, so he must be a bad guy. He was called a quarantine evader, so he must be a bad guy. If anyone fails to see how this power could possibly be abused, it blows my mind that the, the leaders of the valiant resistance, the Democrats, who absolutely despise Trump, everything he stands for, wants to give him the power to declare anyone he wants a potential carrier of coronavirus and thus subject to indefinite detention at the hands of the military if need be. Absolutely crazy, and it's playing out in Israel as well. But of course, the American conservative frames this as Israel joining Iran and China in focusing on the powerful intelligence gathering tools uh, to, uh, that the state uses on its own citizens. But it's interesting, this obviously, this report from Barbara Boland, written shortly before uh, she saw the report from the Seattle Times admitting the U.S. government is doing the exact same thing as well. So it's not just Iran and China and Israel, it's Every country in the world that can do so, presumably, is looking into this right now. Uh, more pieces along the trail, for example, in Britain. Uh, we get from news.sky.com. Coronavirus. Thousands of armed forces staff could be put on standby, standby over COVID-19 spread. More than 10,000 British soldiers, sailors, and airmen could be put on standby in the coming weeks as the coronavirus crisis worsens. Officials have been drawing up plans for weeks and are now ready to submit 
proposals to the Prime Minister. The plans, codenamed Operation Broadshare, according to Army sources, were originally due a few weeks ago, but have been delayed so they can be altered to reflect the rapid spread of the virus. So yes, the military is being prepared for its role in helping out with this disaster response. And here comes Canada as well, my home and native land, which... Uh, it has been trending in the news recently about the Emergencies Act, previously known as the War Measures Act, which received royal assent in 1988 and was created to provide a legal framework for power to be temporarily consolidated with the Prime Minister and Cabinet to issue executive orders during national emergencies like COVID-19. And it has only ever been invoked three times in Canada during the First and Second World Wars, as well as during the October crisis of 1970, when members of the Front de Libération du Québec abducted then-provincial provincial deputy premier Pierre Laporte and British, British diplomat James Cross. And of course, there's always that famous, infamous clip of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the presumed father of the current Canadian Prime Minister, uh, saying, how far will you take this? Oh, just watch me, uh, invoking the Emergencies Act and martial law in Canada in 1970. Well... Now we have the sun in invoking that specter here in 2020 to combat a very different threat, but one that nonetheless is threatening to shake the foundations of our entire planet, etc. This report coming from Global News Coronavirus, how the Emergencies Act could help Canada's struggling economy, but it's not just the Emergencies Act. As previous corporate report guest uh, Dan Dix at pressfortruth.ca has pointed out, there's another act that may come into play uh, in this crisis, the Quarantine Act. At any cost, how far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Uh, just watch me. At, at uh, reducing civil liberties? To that extent? To what extent? Well, would, if you extend this and you say, okay, you're going to do anything to protect them, this include wiretapping, uh, reducing other civil liberties in some ways? Yes, I think the society must take every means at its disposal to defend itself against the uh, emergent of a parallel power which defies the elected power in this country, and I think that goes to any distance. So long as there is a power in here which is challenging the elected representative of the people, I think that power must be stopped, and I think it, it's only, uh, I repeat, weak need uh, bleeding hearts who are afraid to take these measures. Weak need bleeding hearts who are afraid to take these measures. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the father of Justin Trudeau, who back in the 70s had just enacted the War Measures Act, which is now known as the Emergencies Act. Here it is, folks. And right now, today, it just so happens to be trending on Twitter. We see Emergency Measures Act and Emergencies Act now trending on Twitter because just today, Trudeau announced they may now have new emergency measures under consideration. So this has a lot of people talking about what he potentially means when it comes to enacting this act, which is why it's trending on Twitter. But today I want to bring to your attention another act that I think is of the utmost importance that's largely going under the radar and completely missed by everyone. This is what should be trending here instead of Emergencies Act is this one, ladies and gentlemen, the Quarantine Act, which uh, achieved royal descent back in 2005 following the SARS outbreak. And this is the one that would give the Canadian government the ability to enact all-out martial law and to completely obliterate the rights of Canadian citizens. So in this video, we're going to be taking a close look at just what kind of things the Quarantine Act is going to give the Canadian government the ability to do to you and me under this COVID-19 pandemic. The link to that video, of course, will be in the show notes so you can get the full report from Dan Dix about the Quarantine Act and how that may be used and invoked in this situation in Canada. But I hope what I've put out on, on the table so far has at least set the table so that we do understand this is happening all around the world right now. Military responses of various sorts, the type of martial law response is being readied in country after country after country. And it will look different in different countries and it will be implemented differently in different countries, but it is on the table and it is being readied now. And it is important to understand that what is about to happen is essentially 
a PR campaign for martial law. It is the softening of the public to the idea of martial law because the most likely scenario for the unfolding of this martial law crackdown will not be army officers with guns pointed in your faces shooting people's heads off in plain sight. It will be the friendly, cuddly, wonderful army coming along and, and, and making sure that distributing food or whatever it is in, in crisis situations, and yes, helping to enforce quarantines and what have you. That is the propaganda coup for the martial law planners that could be about to take place. And that actually is the nightmare scenario, because people who have been warning about the dangers of martial law and martial law scenarios who have been called crazy conspiracy theorists for thinking that governments would ever bring in the military to involve in day-to-day -day policing. Well, now, of course we need the military here, and of course it's going to be sunshine and rainbows when it happens. And the absolute nightmare scenario is if it is done, and there is a hunker down, and we got to get through this, and weeks or months or however long later, it's lifted, and... Oh, what a relief. Everything's better again. All right, so that wasn't so bad. I guess these powers are good, and I guess any time there is a nationally declared emergency, now that precedent has been uh, set, the switch is a lot easier to flip on now, isn't it? And that will happen. And that is scary, because it does undermine uh, the argument against martial law. Why are you so scared of this, you crazy conspiracy theorist? This is an interesting propaganda phenomenon that I've noted before. In fact, most recently in a conversation that was just rec recorded with Charlie Robinson for a program that he does for Iconic uh, that has not yet been released, at least at the time that I'm recording this podcast, but I will include a link to it when and if it does become available. But I'm just going to play a short clip from that conversation that we had along these lines to help you to understand what is happening and the propaganda coup that could be taking place right under our nose. Well, we in the alternative media slash conspiracy research world have talked about martial law for a long, long time. It's this theory. It's this thing out there. It's, uh, you know, that's what happens in war-torn countries. That's what happened in, you know, in World War II or, or it's, it's abstract to us. Um, but you would put out a new video talking about medical martial law. And it struck me that that might be the most realistic form of martial law, because in order for overt martial law to take hold, you think of people, you know, troops on the streets with guns telling you you have to stay inside your house. But as we know, the best form of censorship is self-censorship. So the best form of martial law is self-martial law, where you quarantine yourself. And it seems that the medical component to this is if you were an evil genius sitting in your bat cave, you know, trying to think of some way to control the population, you'd say, well, I'd want them to control themselves. They couldn't devise a better f way of doing it than a medical pandemic, could they? This is just the blueprint for us demanding our own uh, self-isolation. Is it not? Exactly right. And it's almost, yeah, it's almost like they did engineer this. Oh, well, Ooh, what, a, what a crazy if... thought that would be, you conspiracy theorist. Put my tinfoil hat on. Yeah, exactly. Well, I have no I have no definitive proof on that one way or another. It seems quite likely to me that this, if assuming this is really spreading and this really is a thing, which even that has question marks over it, but assuming it is, it would, it would seem most likely to me that this is some sort of engineered virus of some sort that may have escaped by accident. It may have been unleashed on purpose. Again, I don't know, and uh, I, I'm not going to speculate on, on speculation. But certainly, it is almost like this is a dream scenario for any would-be authoritarian that wants to flex the martial law muscle, because exactly as you said, this is kind of the nightmare scenario for people who are still concerned about what has still remained of civil liberties in our age. Even saying that seems almost, uh, uh, what are you talking about? That that was so pre-9-11. Well, 
this is the new 9-11 and they're going to take even more away from what people have, uh, the liberties that people have enjoyed hitherto. And precisely because it is coming on the back of this concern that is being, as, as I say, psychologically driven into the public to make them demand, to clamor for their own enslavement to a certain extent. And this is a phenomenon that I've noted before on the podcast. In fact, you say this is a new video that I've released about medical martial law. It is a new video, but it is based. It is actually the audio of a podcast that I did 11 years ago during the swine flu hype of 2009. Remember that? Yeah, I do. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I was noting at that time that even then, for several years up to that point, they'd been preparing various legislative proposals and things for instituting medical martial law in the event of some sort of medical scenario, uh, like the Public State Health Emergency Act, whatever the exact name of that is. But uh, the model law that they, they drafted in the wake of 9-11 during the anthrax scare that then they started passing in state legislature after state legislature all around the U.S. in order to basically codify and make sure that they had these emergency powers that they're now invoking. Um, these things can take decades. Sometimes it'll be the, the infrastructure, the legislative framework will be laid decades in advance. And suddenly, once that, once that switch is flipped, once the lever is pulled, suddenly people are like, oh, I didn't know this even existed. Yeah, it's been there for decades, and some people have been warning you about it. Um... I, in fact, I note with some bemusement that I think the second or third most popular video that I have ever done on my YouTube channel, um, over 2 million views, I believe, was about martial law. It was about the U.S. US Army prepares to invade U.S., which is a uh, video that I did back in 2008, before the 2008 selection cycle played out. And it was talking about the moves that had been made through uh, decades, really. Um, Reagan, uh, Clinton, uh, Bush 1, Bush 2... All of these regimes had implemented various variations on setting the framework for martial law, preparing for martial law, doing martial law exercises, training American troops to go in. And I, I did that video, and for I, I found it amazing that that video really did go viral um, very early on. I had maybe a thousand YouTube subscribers at that point, but then I was getting hundreds of thousands of views on this video, precisely because uh, a lot of Democrats and people on the left side thought that I was saying oh, Bush is going to do martial law to try to lock it down so that he'll continue on in the presidency. No, I was specifically pointing out, no, it was Clinton and Bush and left and right. They both do this because it is a, it is authoritarians want this structure in place. And as you say, medical martial law is the most insidious way to do it because it will have popular support. This is some, This is a point that I've tried to make before and I think people were incredulous about. When martial law arrives... Most people will be cheering. They will not be jeering. And precisely because we are now being conditioned with the stories of this man was diagnosed and then he went out and went shopping. And so they had to lock him in his home and everyone's like, yeah, lock that bastard up. We are being trained right now with stories like that, that you better believe there is an agenda to reporting on things like that and in that way to get people on board with the idea of medical martial law. And my nightmare scenario that I almost even hate to put out into the world because I don't like to put these ideas out there, although I know that the would-be social planners already have them in mind, is that this, what we are looking at, could be the absolute ideal perfect way to implant the martial law idea in the public's mind because imagine this imagine this scenario the viral freak out right now from what we know is 100 percent overblown um yeah. yes there is a i mean sure if you're an octogenarian with a lung condition definitely you want to stay safe and all of that I'm not trying to downplay that. And some people will get sick, some people will die, but this is not the Black Death. This is not the end of the world, at least from what we've seen so far, unless there's some sort of, you know, second wave to this that's been bioengineered, whatever. I don't know about that. But from what we've seen so far, this is obviously overblown. So imagine this. Imagine we go into martial law lockdown scenario, National Guard out. We have these stories about these brave martial law, you know, National Guard soldiers making sure people stay in their homes and... And uh, they deliver the food and whatever, you know, it, it, there was this emergency over here, but they took care of it. And then after a few weeks of this, whatever it is, enough, obviously, to get people conditioned to it, 
the uh, veil is lifted, uh, the martial law is over, we've, we've ridden out the storm, the worst is over, the, suddenly the reporting goes from, this is Black Death, you're all gonna die, to, okay, it's still here, but it's, it's now under control, and we've got it taken care of. Imagine that scenario plays out, and everyone who now tries to say martial law and, you know, they're coming, troops will be on the streets, will be looked at as, oh, you silly conspiracy theorists, there was martial law, and it was fine. Imagine that scenario playing out, because that will be the ultimate, 100%, the greatest propaganda coup for the the, uh, the the authoritarians there ever could be. Yeah, martial law happened, and it was okay. It wasn't, you know, we had to hunker down, but we all, we all stuck through it, and it was all right, and in the end, they went away, and everything's better again. So they have these martial law powers on the books. They, it's happened before. The precedent is set. It's there forever. Their power that they can take at any time, as soon as they drum up fear into the public, they'll, they'll, people will dutifully lock themselves in. It's a propaganda coup that could be taking place right now, and uh, I fear to see, see that because, again, our, our ability to get people concerned about the very real loss of fundamental liberties that is taking place right now will be vastly undermined. They'll, they'll cut the legs out of all of us conspiracy realists who have been warning about this for years and will want to warn people about how, how this uh, power could be abused. Um, again, this is it's a it's a horrific situation because it works so well for the propagandists and the authoritarians. The very first step in solving any problem is to admit that there is a problem, and usually you wouldn't think that that's very difficult to do. But it is nonetheless a fact that in any time of great crisis or adversity, a trick that your own brain will pull on you in order to give you a false sense of security is to normalize the situation. Oh, there's no crisis, there's no emergency, everything will go back to normal in a few weeks and we'll continue on with our lives as they were before. Do not normalize what is happening here. This is not normal. Medical martial law, troops on the street, internal passports and checkpoints, orders to shelter in place, permission to leave your home, enforced quarantines and isolation, business closures, nationalization of industry, collapses of economies. This is not normal. This is a crisis, and we have to recognize it as such. The calm, rational, measured response to no for finding out that your house is on fire is not to sit there and pontificate and wonder what things will be like for a few hours from now. No, it is to get out of the house and to start pouring water on that fire. You have to do something. But the very, very first step is to realize that there is a problem. So do not normalize. Do not give in to the temptation to normalize the absolute craziness that is happening right now. Realize that this is the perfectly logical end result of decades of carefully laid infrastructure for the implementation of a medical martial law situation. And what is happening right now are powers being accrued by authoritarians that will never be relinquished. Once these powers are put in place and the precedent is there, even if the emergency is released and everything goes back to normal a few weeks from now, it will be a new normal in which any authoritarian at any time will be able to press the panic button to cause pandemonium in the public and to reclaim all of these emergency, temporary measures that are being claimed right now. This is a big deal, and we do need to be concerned about it. Now, the very first step, as I say, is to admit that there is a problem. The second step, once you understand that there is a problem, is to inform yourself about that problem, the history of that problem, where it came from, and what you can do about it. And on that note, there are going to be lots of notes in the show notes for you to go through. Lots of links to articles and videos and other things that will help to further inform you about this very important time that we're living through. And as always, one of the greatest resources that we have is each other, which is why I wholeheartedly exhort the Corbett Report community to come together. Members, Corbett Report members, please leave your experiences, your thoughts, your observations, your links, your research in the comment section at CorbettReport.com. We need to learn our way forward on this together. 
But it all starts from admitting that this is a crisis. There is an emergency situation happening right now. And the calm and rational and measured response to an emergency situation that is happening around you is to let others know there is a problem here. Do not normalize this. This is not normal. We are heading into medical martial law. On that note, I'm going to leave it here today, but obviously no single podcast can encapsulate all of the crazy information that is pouring forth through the news feeds on an hourly, if not minutely basis at this point. So, obviously, we will be returning to various aspects of this topic in the weeks to come, including the economic aspects of this agenda that is playing out, the geopolitical aspects, and of course the creation of the technocratic state that I've been warning about for many years now. And I hope you'll be here for that exploration, because this is extremely important information. But we're going to leave it here today. I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, looking forward to talking to you in the very near future. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com slash support.